Hi guys, and uh, welcome back. It's uh, time for population geography, chapter five in your uh, textbooks. I didn't write down the page number, forgot to do that, but uh, you'll um, be led to some visuals so you could find all that. Um, let me um, show you something here. I, this is, I, I had said that we are now going to be um, heading into the uh, non-science, the non uh, um, conventional uh, subject of geography that people know about, and we're going to uh, population geography. Um, kind of a uh, a cool graphic here. Uh, I do this in my live classes. Uh, we start this section off by looking at uh, the world of uh, the world dominator, the world dominator. And uh, I remember when this crossed seven. That was. Um, when I got to seven, it was kind of ironic. It was a, uh, cl a class I was having, and um, it was Halloween of 2011. Two Halloween of 2011. So that's how much the population has uh, increased in uh, you know almost uh, almost ten years, uh, ten and a half, uh, nine and a half years. But um, so right now. Um, the population right now is uh, today the population growth is um, you know 138,000 and we just moved so fast this is uh, calculated at the UN and uh, you could you know, births today deaths today uh, births this year right deaths this year and population population growth uh, this year so what what you could do and uh, you could uh, let me know um how this calculates out well at the end of the class i will at the end of the lecture we'll if i remember i'm going to pop this back up sometimes i forget this live too pop it back up i always have someone calculate all right how many people were born or how the how many how much did the population increase during this class period right so um you might want to do that and and uh, just to uh i think you'll find that interesting and um you know, get back to me on, um, you know, what those what those figures figures were. So um, there you have it. Just pick a you know pick a spot here, and um, I'm gonna get back to um, where I want to go here. The lecture model for chapter chapter five. I just gotta remember to flip that back over. Population geography. Um, we're going to take a look at. Here's the major heads up terms we want where we want to go. Crude birth rate. Uh, crude birth rate is the number of births per 1,000 people. Right, the number of births per 1,000 people. Uh, the crude death rate, the number of deaths per 1,000 people. Uh, crude density. Crude density is, um, you know one of the ways that we keep population, right? Population density, and this is a more familiar way, the number of people per political political entity. Uh, demographic momentum, right? Demogra demography and demographics, we're talking about population. We're gonna get into that um, population programs and so forth to kind of curb population growth. And, uh, but there's a lot of demographic momentum, right? These, these um, you could argue maybe some of these programs are maybe stopping, slowing the bleeding, but the population momentum around the globe is um, hasn't been ebbing. The demographic transition model. There's a general four stage model that it, geographers look at. Um, there's now a, there's a fifth one that I'll get into, but it's basically about you know each stage and how many births and death rates are you having at each stage. Demography, again, we're talking about population studies. Uh, the dependency ratio. It's looked at the production stages. People's production stages are generally looked at from 15, 15 years of age. Around 15, you are in a, uh, it's fair to say you're in a, a productive stage where you can produce. And the calculation is up to about 64, 15 through 64. And I'm thinking about having you guys play around with this with a lab later on in the week, picking some countries and looking at the dependency ratios. But um, 
the way it, the way it works is, you know, how many people do you have under 15, right, who are not in a production stage? And some of your developing countries, a lot of, you will see in here, uh, a lot of high birth rates, right? A lot of children. And they're not in production stages. So someone's got to be able to cover for them. Same thing for, you know, 65 and olders, right? 65 and olders start getting into that, um, you know, into that realm and uh, your you know, chances for production get uh, uh, a dwindle, right? Because of age and someone has to take care of that end, right? So uh, out of 100 people, uh, you the more people out of 100 that have to take care of uh, both those ends, it's, it's not a good thing, right? The dependency ratio. Doubling time kind of plays into that. Um, every se about 70 years, about 70 years, especially in the Western world, the developed world, the population will double. Again, some of the poor countries or agricultural countries uh, where you have high population rates, uh, you uh, have a tendency that some of those countries have been double in 35 years, right? So Thomas Malthus, uh, I'm probably going to see a short video of him um, on, um, hopefully you're looking at this on a Monday when, uh, you know, the week is starting, uh, but um, got a video, short video of Malthus. And Thomas Malthus was a, um, put out a treatise in the late 1700s, I think it was 1798. And it's basically about population growth that we had to watch it because, you know, we it's getting to the point where food production wouldn't be able to keep up with population growth. And um, he wasn't right about that. You know, he just didn't foresee technology. But um, nevertheless, he he wrote this treatise. He was a, a, a demographer, of course. He was um, a uh, economist and also a, a reverend. Right, he was also a reverend. Uh, the Neo Malthusian, eh, around the 1800s, Industrial Revolution, uh, as early as the 1830s, 1840s, they kind of took his uh, writings and went a little farther with it. And they started introducing family planning measures. And we'll talk about the differences between Mr. Malthus and the Neo Malthusians. Uh, population density, again, another, um, another way to. Uh, uh, you measure, uh, you know, measure population, and uh, there's some. Uh, you have um, uh, population pyramids, right? Population pyramids that uh, examine this. We'll look at some of the population pyramids, uh, or otherwise called called age sex diagrams, and they're able to tell you. They're able to help governments forecast uh, the future in population. Uh, population projections. Uh, rate of natural increase. Rate of natural increase is where you take the number of people being born right, out of a thousand people, which I talked about earlier, subtract the, the deaths out of a thousand people, and that's your rate of natural increase. And then your total fertility rate, right? Your total fertility rate, this speaks of just basically only women that uh, can um, reproduce. Some of the major, well, our objectives we want to do, we want to interpret population pyramids, uh, develop insight on government reform for the developing world, and uh, rate the pros and cons of family planning measures to combat uh, population explosion. Um, got your lecture model there, and uh, let me um, just set it up here. We're going to get into population growth and some popular definitions. Uh, population geography deals with deals with growth and the, the composition or the, the makeup of something and the distribution of people in relation to spatial variations and physical and cultural geographic conditions are what we're speaking of. Uh, demographic, you know, me, uh, measures basic uh, to geographic analysis. And, and the, the, when I'm talking about demography here, I, I'm, I'm talking about that, I'm talking about the study of uh, population in, a, in a, uh, a quantitative sense, right, with uh, numerical tools. And this includes birth rate, um, fertility rate, death rate, and rate and percentage of uh, natural increase. 
take a look at this. Got some notes here. And um, crude birth rates, crude birth rates, if I break this down here, this is the annual number of births per 1,000 persons. It does not relate to births, not, it doesn't relate births to age or sex. So it's dubbed crude, right? It's also crude since it includes folks who have no chance of giving birth. For example, men, children, seniors, and you can take a look at figure five, three on page 114. So a visual on this. Fertility rates of the total fertility rate, the TFR, um, single out only women with the possibility of reproduction. You can see page 116, figure 5.5. Five. So the crude, the crude death rate, the crude death rate is tabulated the same way as the crude birth rate, just inverse, right? The annual number of deaths per 1,000 persons, or if you please, the mortality rate. And uh, you can look at page 118, figure figure five, seven. Now, one of the more interesting things, and there's so many interesting things in geography are the uh, population pyramid. And um, if you turn to page, where do I want to go with that? Yeah, page 121, there we go. I knew I had to have this down because it's a, a great visual. Page 121, figure 5, 9, and uh, figure 10. And these, this is how these are calculated, or how they're used. And you can see, um, let's take a look at the U.S., okay? Look at the U.S. in the middle of page 121. And you have on the left-hand side males, and on the right-hand side the females. And then you have the age brackets. Right, and you have the percent of population at the scale at the bottom, and uh, in 2010, uh, you can you know get a, a a good look at all the age quadrants quadrants there of you know population growth via the uh, via the sexes. Okay, and um, and again, this is called um, age. These are called age sex diagrams uh, as well. But here's the thing with the population pyramids: the Construction in the pyramid begins with the younger generation at the bottom of the pyramid. As one goes up the pyramid, the population gets older and, and therefore thins. So a country that has a rapidly growing population forms a pyramid with the sides that are sloped. And uh, you can take them, you can look, see Uganda, right? Uganda, uh, figure, and figure five, nine. Uh, young population, young population pyramid. So the, you know, as you go up, it tends to slope. Now, population pyramids help foretell the future. For instance, back when um, China held it a one-child policy, and since 2015, they've made that a two-child policy now. Uh, but the pyramid was bent, right? Obviously, in favor of males. And uh, your authors. If I remember correctly, your authors, I'm surprised they do not have a um, population pyramid of, uh, of China, but uh, nevertheless, they do not. But take my word for it, right? With the one child policy, um, you know, the pyramid is bent in favor of males, which caused an imbalance, right, in the marriage market, threatening social stability and, and disorder. And what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to read the article on page 115, um, thinking ahead now about um, yeah, the discussion questions later in the week. I haven't really drawn those out yet, but uh, I, might, uh, I might want reference to the one child policy. So look at page 115, it's a short article on the one child policy. Um, Knowing a country's age and sex, right, the big picture here, allows demographers kind of a window, if you will, on future population levels. So the population pyramid. Start looking now at uh, the rate of natural increase. And you can turn now uh, to 
figure five eleven on page one twenty two. And then we have we'll break this down via some fill in the blank. And let me set this up first. Uh, the stage of economic development is um, kind of a principal correlate of developed and developing countries. And when we talk about developed countries, right, we're talking about a modern country with a well-developed economy. Um, but your, your highest rates of natural increase, they're generally found in agricultural regions or developing states, right? Developing, developing countries, it's geograph geographical term is states, right? That's the clinical term. Uh, death rates are cle uh, less clearly associated with any kind of developmental level. And even in un underdeveloped countries, uh, the mortality rate declines have, have occurred with improved sanitation and medical care. Although regions, particularly in the Sub-Sahara Africa region with a high incidence of AIDS, uh, have no significant mortality increases. Again, uh, you know, you can look at the map on page 122, uh, figure 511, and look at this pretty cool map to, um, to kind of highlight what I'm talking about here. Let's take a look at the rate of natural increase. And uh, your first fill there is you subtract the crude death rate. You subtract the crude death rate from the crude birth rate. This does not include migration. For example, if your birth rate is 18 people born per 1,000 people and your death rate is six people per 1,000, your final tally, you just do the, the subtraction there, 12 persons per 1,000 people alive. So per 1,000 people, if you do the percent there, that's 1.2% increase a year, okay? Now, um, if, if it's a 1%, that's kind of where we are in the U.S. and the West, right? I'm kind of um, I'm giving you our numbers. So at a 1%, 1.2% increase, you're going to double. Your population is going to double at 70, okay? Now, doubling time is where the population doubles, right? Where the population doubles, population doubles, and it takes 35 years, or it takes 70 years at 1% to double, all right? Uh, for example, uh, Argentina and Thailand. Uh, Kenya and Peru they had a 2% increase back in 2003, meaning that they're going to double in 35 years. They're going to double in 35 years. So how is this tabulated? And you can take a look at figure 514, um, figure, figure uh, or on page uh, 124. How is this tabulated? Well, the current growth, the current growth rate by 70, Right. In other words, 70 divided by two is 35. Right. So if you're growing at two, if you're growing at two percent, right here in the United States in the West, you're growing by one point two percent. So times that by or divide that by 70, uh, you're growing, at, you know, you're doubling in about 70 years. If you're growing at two percent, though, and you divide that by two, that's 35, right? 35 years. Peru. And again, you can look at some tables over on figures five, two, and three on page 124. So roughly when you're growing at 2% and your population is doubling in 35 years, um, you're getting about 20 new births per 1,000 folks. Okay. Turn now to page 125. I want, to look at, I want you to look at the demographic transition model uh, figure 516. So before I talk about this or after, uh, for your visual types, you'll want to take a look at it. And all it's always been a four-stage model, um, and I'll get to the fifth stage because this is where a lot of some of the West is heading. Uh, so there's now now a fifth stage at, stage added, but the first stage, and you can see this with your visual there. The uh, first stage consists of high birth rates, 
but high fluctuating death rates. The second stage has falling death rates and high birth rates apart from the effects of industrialization. The stage is also affected by higher rates of life expectancy. Stage three, your third stage, includes declining birth rates based off of family control. And this is kind of where most of your developing world is today, okay? So, and here's the thing too, because uh, we don't want to be reverent about this. Based off of what society one lives in, high birth rates could be an asset. So I don't, I don't want this to sound like, oh, high birth rates, having too many kids, bad, right? I don't want to make it sound like that because in, you know, high birth rates could be an asset, especially if you live in a, a developing country that is also an agricultural society. We don't have the, the, the modern technologies. They can blame maybe a bad government for not uh, promoting economic growth where they can have a lot of technology, but that would be maybe for my world regional geography class to, to riff on that, and I do. Or it can be a liability. High population rates can be a liability if the society is an industrial society. And I would throw this in too, which probably would fall into the orbit of my world regional geography class. If you're a Catholic, if you're a Catholic country, right, uh, you know, to go in and try to influence people to, um, you know, about, you know, being reticent about procreating could be uh, offensive as well, right? Um, the fourth stage is where both birth and death rates are low, which is where the West is today, okay? And then you have the fifth stage, which geographers are just starting to look at because um, the um, West has been so um, focused and obsessed with, you know, the low birth rates and people, you know, we have modern medicine today and people, you know, who wants to, don't want to die. So you have people living longer that um, the death rates are now higher than the birth rates, you know, when one is in a fifth stage. When one's in a fifth stage, so kind of where we're going today uh, in the in the West. Let's take a look at world population distribution, population density, uh, page one thirty four and figure figure five four. Um, just setting this up here too. Uh, the world's population is is evenly uh, is unevenly distributed with uh, most people found uh, north of the equator in lowland zones on, on continental margins and decreasingly in, in rural areas. You have four great uh, world population clusters that exist in East Asia, right? We're thinking um, China, Japan, South Asia, thinking India, uh, Europe, uh, and East North America, right? Probably from yeah, I'm thinking the megalopolis here, uh, maybe from Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh on over to, uh, you know, from Washington up to Boston, right? Uh, population density measures include crude density and physiological density. So I'm going to talk, I want you to learn about some, yeah, some different ways to uh, measure population density. Crude density you're familiar with, right? Crude density, this is the calculation of folks per unit area of land within a uh, political entity. Physiological density is total population divided by arable land. How much land can you really use, right? Uh, table 5-4 on page 134. Uh, and I, I get into this, again, we're world regional geography. But uh, we look at Canada in that regard, and Canada, at least half of it, it's not arable. And uh, so when you take a look at population density with, with, with Canada as a whole, it's very sparse. But when you start to look at it, you know, in terms of arable land, it, uh, you know, it changes the uh, complexion. Uh, it's not a lot, but it, it's noticeable, right? You can imagine. And then agricultural density, another interesting way to look at this. 
Uh, agricultural de uh, density excludes urban areas. It tabulates how many people per square mile of rural areas of rural areas are in existence. Take a look here at, um, I'm going to say something, I know you guys are running ahead of me, population data and projections. And population data are not fully reliable, but projections based on alternate assumptions concerning them suggest that for some world areas, population pressures are increasing to a point of a crisis. Now, Thomas Moffat, talk about him in a second here, he called attention to the inevitability of unsupportable population growth back in 1798. Let's break it down. Malthus was a um, British economist and demographer, and he put out this treatise in 1798 uh, in regard to a projection that food production will not, will, will inevitably, will inevitably not keep up with uh, population increases. So a viewpoint did grow out of this, however, known as the Neo-Malthusians, and they advocated national and international programs of population control via birth control, right, via birth control uh, and, and family planning. And you can see figure 527 on page 137. Here's the thing, though, a major difference, a major difference between Malthus's remedies and the modern remedies is that Malthus uh, recommended, he, he did not recommend uh, family planning prescriptions. prescriptions. Uh, Malthus rather stressed chastity, right? I don't think that would go over, right? Um, Malthus stressed chastity. And then lastly, uh, pop, uh, demographic population fertility programs, uh, demographic momentum. Demographic momentum can stunt the most formidable uh, population fertility programs in that when a good percentage of the population is young, uh, the result of past high fertility rates, uh, larger increases of women enter into childbearing years. So the reality is good is good is a good portion of the world, right? That, that reality is a good portion of the world. The population's far younger than industrialized nations, especially in your agricultural types of nations, 40% uh, in Africa. Again, I would harken back to that, the, the page on page 122 that I introduced you to earlier. And this is gonna be, to, to continue to be felt until these folks are too old. And I don't mean to be irreverent. I've never been able to think of a good word to, to use here. And I forgot to X, erase it for you guys. Too old to breed. So, okay, I provided a graphic organizer for you guys. So you can go back over and uh, kind of recap you know, what we, um, you know, what we just talked about, You've got birth rates there, the types of birth rates, population pyramids, rate of natural increase, the demographic transition with the, the four stage model, population density with the, you know, types of, you know, different ways to measure population density, Malthus, the Neo-Malthusians, and then population fertility program. So check out, especially visual types, check out the um, graphic organizer. Okay, so we'll jut out of there. Yep, check out your graphic organizer. And let's see what's up ahead here. I mean, you got by now, you guys know the drill, but I do, there is something I want to um, want to emphasize. And um, that is the anytime I talk about having videos, watch those. They're short. They're short, and for you audio-visual types, it helps you to learn. It kind of goes over some of my main point, my main points. I got a short video on the total fertility rate, death rates, and Thomas, Mr. Malthus. And you're going to want to incorporate these into your discussion questions, right? So 
when you see the videos, when I mention those, or some kind of an extra reading, if I don't see those, look at your rubric, if I don't see those in the discussion, you're probably not going to get the perfect 10, right? And um, there was something else I wanted to mention that um, I, I uh, wanted to make sure I saw. And, um, oh well, I don't remember what it was right now. I wanted to talk to you guys. I should have put it on my billboard there. Okay, so um, that's kind of a wrap on this week. Uh, let's go back um, just for the fun of it and uh, see how many uh, births there were this um, Know if my screen share was on there. Okay. Yeah, there it is. So uh, I, I mean, I was lazy. I was lazy. I um, left that up to you guys. But uh, births today, and um, I don't know where that was at the beginning of this. I probably should have looked myself. But uh, if, if someone tabulated that, I would be, uh, um, it would please me. It would please the prof, as they say. <laughs> we get that information. Uh, but uh, so there you have it, the world, the worldometer. Okay, well, until next time, guys, you guys have a fantastic week. And um, I got, like I said, if you have questions, except for Sundays, I am on it, right? At least sometime during the day. You guys have a great, fantastic week. Do well in everything. And uh, I'll uh, talk to you next time.